<sighs> Hello everyone. I wanted to talk about money today. And I wanted to talk about it because I see in the world that it is not completely spoken about. I see that there are unspoken assumptions about money in many people and I wish to speak them out. I feel that there are many unrecognized emotions within us related to money and I wish to state them out loud so that they can perhaps find a conscious resonance in other people that can that listen to this message. The way people treat money in every in everyday life is fairly straightforward. We have money that we can give to other people in exchange for their goods, for their resources, and vice versa. Resources being not necessarily only material goods, but energy, time, effort, <clears throat> services, transportation, anything that we humans can help each other with. It is a manifestation of value in the physical world. And it's a very useful manifestation because it helps us distribute resources in a standard way that we can all share these days across the entire globe. In a sense, it is a lubricant for the distribution of resources. Mm. Much as the oil in an engine <clears throat> is distributed all throughout its parts so that they all have, so that they all can flow smoothly, that they can all do their job correctly and not dry up. And in this, in this application, in this use that money has, it has a great value to us as humans, to us in, as a society. However, it happens quite often that this usefulness is equated with a value that is beyond the scope of money. And when that happens, I believe that undesired and detrimental consequences ensue. I wish to speak about 
the emotions that I have served that are that relate to money <clears throat> in the lives of people. The main emotion, the obvious emotion that comes up with it is fear. The fear of lack. Money is so pervasive in our society that the lack of it, the, the absolute lack of it is almost inconceivable. <clears throat> and the lack of it, the not having enough to support my own life, my own body, or in the, in the bodies and lives of those that I have a duty and responsibility over, feels very undesirable. Because in the material sense, lacking what I need to sustain myself, sustain my life, sustain my well-being, is failure. It is a failure to provide for myself to sustain my own life. And I feel that we humans have a primal fear of failure. And in the realm of material possessions, this translates in our society to a, a fear of lack of money. It is not always conscious, but it very often just lives there and lurks in the corners or shadows of our psyche and influences many of our decisions including for example our desire to acquire more to hoard our possessions and our unwillingness to share it with others who may need it This fear arises because sometimes we people tend to equate the concept of money and the concept of well-being. We as humans, all of us naturally are looking for well-being, we're looking to be well healthy, to have enough for our needs and for our immediate desires. And in the world of material, material resources, it is easy to fall into the fallacy that money and well-being are the same. We might think that we know that they are different, but very often this, <clears throat> the concepts of money and well-being are stuck together. And it is hard to, and, and they are stuck together at an unconscious level. And that's where our fear arises from. From the fear that if the level of money that we have diminishes, so will my well-being, up to perhaps the point of failure, <clears throat> in whichever form that takes, whether it is lack, poverty, ostracism or death.
Another emotion that is quite related to fear. Whoops. Monitor turn off. <sighs> Another emotion that is <clears throat> quite related to fear in our human context is shame. I see shame can be quite related to money. And that often happens because just as <clears throat> just as one can equate money to well-being, one can also um, conclude the fallacy of thinking that money is equivalent to worth. And we often conclude that because money is so often given such a high value, such a prominent position all around in our society. Every material thing we, we can acquire, we acquire it through money. When, when offers and prices and the good things are touted and placed in front of us, they so very often are related to money. <clears throat> you can win the lottery, you can get 50 million units. You can get, you can, you can win this prize, you can win this prize that is worth 5,000 units. And when it's so prominently displayed and we are bombarded by it day in, day out, it's natural to begin to assume that that is where the worth is. If that is where all the people seem to be placing their attention onto, then it's a natural conclusion to believe that that's where the worth is. And in my experience, it is not. Mm. So shame arises. <clears throat> and shame can arise because if we have our worth stuck to the concept of money, and if we feel that we don't have enough money, that perhaps our the level of money is, seems lesser than that person, that this person, or that, or what I think that I should have, or what the, these other people think that I should have. Then as the level of money goes, go, diminishes, my level of worth go, goes together along with it. Because we have made the assumption that these two concepts are tied together. And that is not, that is not an, a, a true necessity. It is a necessity only because our assumption has tied these two concepts together. And if, if they are stuck together, then we cannot feel worth when our level of money is low. But when we release ourselves from these assumptions, this particular assumption, then, then we can be free. And then we can be free to focus our worth on something different, on other things, while our level of money fluctuates as it is prone to do in life. I do not mean to say that the topic of money should be ignored and neglected and considered ah, 
totally unimportant. It is an aspect of life and it's important to give it attention and the upkeep it requires in order so that it can keep so that it can keep our uh, physical well-being but equating it to worth in the general sense to our worth limits us to keeping our worth in the physical realm and that does not allow us to grow beyond beyond to towards the full potential that we have as complete human beings. So that's where shame arises from, <clears throat> from this false equivalence of money with worth. And just as shame arises from the feeling of lesser worth, The, its flip side, pride, can also arise when we believe that we are of greater worth, greater worth than our neighbors, greater worth than our than what than what other people think that we are that we should have. Uh, it is the emotional sense of superiority. Hmm. It is that feeling that we are better because we have more in, the, in its relationship with money. And the curious issue with pride is that Pride is only really a thing, only exists in this context when there is also shame. They are connected. <clears throat> they are the flip side of one of another. Because if one feels correct or better, if one feels better because one feels one has greater worth and perhaps money, then one also feels worse because one, feel, one, one feels one has lesser worth or money. They are, I believe, quite the flip side of each other. <clears throat> and they both rely on this assumption that money and worth are tied together. And that it's not true. I speak from personal experience. <clears throat> and as someone speaking from their own personal and necessarily biased perspective, I feel it's right to state some of what my financial experience has been like. I do not believe I have ever, ever experienced um, lack to the point of, of, of not being able to take care of my body. I have, been always, I have always had enough <clears throat> money to at least uh, provide food and water and shelter <clears throat> and basic necessities for myself 
And I also have never, have not experienced um, lavishness. Uh, extreme luxury, I believe. <clears throat> But I have traveled through a fairly wide spectrum <clears throat> of the of the financial spectrum. There have been times when I have had close to no money. <laughs> there have been times when I have had more than double the money that I knew that I that I felt comfortable with having that I knew what to do with <clears throat> I imagine there are people who will and can say <clears throat> that that not knowing what to do with money is more of a symptom of financial ignorance, perhaps. <clears throat> but I believe that each person has their own mm, their own situation, unique situation, and their own also nature that allows them to uh, want to use money in certain ways or others. So I believe that while there are people who for which <clears throat> each person is all for, for which they they believe that there's always a correct use for money in, for oneself in some way, or that they, it can always be invested, or it can always be, you know, make the money work for you. Um, I believe there are people also for which that is simply not, um, not a truth, not a, not something that appeals to oneself. Hmm. So that's a bit of um, about my own financial history, a bit vague, somewhat. Hmm. And there's one more emotion that comes up in my comes up to mind. That it's actually the same emotion as before. It is shame. But I see that it also arises in another situation. And I've noticed that shame can arise when there is an excess of wealth. When one realizes that they have more wealth, but they know what to do with. That they can, that they know how to appropriately spend. <clears throat> I mean, that's a curious experience. Because it, it's not an obvious, uh, it's not obvious to know why that chain is there. But the way I've experienced it, it seems to me that that shame comes up because if one, if, if I am the possessor of this money and I do not know what to do with it, if I am uncertain about it, then perhaps I am not worthy to have it.
And I think that's one cause of the discontent that, um, that people with wealth can have, even though it may be unconscious. But if they have more wealth than they innately think, believe they should have, there, then there is a sense of incongruency, incongruency. A sense that perhaps it could be some better placed somewhere else but the fears that we have, this very widespread fear of lack, often disallows us from, <clears throat> from releasing money that we are not using. Because it's because it, fear has set up a barrier inside of us. In my experience, we humans walk around with certain barriers placed around us, past which we do not allow our resources and our care to go th through, to go into. And in general, this barrier is set at the barrier at, at the limit of our well-being. In general, we're concerned towards we're concerned with providing for our own well-being, for the well-being of our physical body, for the well-being of the people that we care around us, for the well-being of the people who are related to us, so that we can maintain good connections and that ultimately they can we can maintain our own well-being through the relationship that we have with them and anything beyond that bubble of well-being is blocked mostly blocked by fear mostly set up mostly there's a barrier here that is set up that prevents care and resources from flowing out, from moving out. It is not um, widespread social uh, norm to, to pierce this barrier of well-being. In general, it is almost an obvious axiom that we care for ourselves and others care for themselves. And up to a point, I believe that is correct. Each of us has responsibility over our own uh, context, over our own circle. And yet what we what we don't realize, if we have this barrier of well, of, of personal well-being, and, and we keep it impermeable, impenetrable, what we're not realizing is that all the rest of the world is also part of our circle. in an extended manner. Because, just as I was saying before, um, money is like this lubricant that allows the whole engine to continue running correctly, to maintain all its parts moving and to not get dry and damaged. And in this engine of 
humanity that we are as a whole, this lubricant needs to flow throughout all through all its parts. And if it doesn't, then some parts of the engine will eventually become dry and damaged and perhaps break. And if a part of the engine breaks, the whole engine suffers the consequences. Perhaps not, not as directly as this part, but it will. A, com a whole engine cannot work correctly if any of its parts is neglected. When we set up these barriers between us and the rest of the world, they tend to be quite unconscious. They tend to be these force fields that we that are placed there by our fear. Usually our fear of lack. It is my experience, and I also notice it in other people, that when there is an, a request for help from people outside our bubble of personal well-being towards us, to ask us for care, attention, for resources, the, the main reaction is ignoring um, ignoring, <laughs> refusal. Unwillingness to recognize that there is a need at all. That's perhaps a, a combination, uh, a drug, um, an effect of the combination of fear and shame that we have. Because we have fear of lack, this fear of lack sets up this impermeable barrier between us and the rest of the world, Set, sets it up. And sometimes and, 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 and there's something within us that knows that we can help. <clears throat> and sometimes that thing will, will vibrate, will say, hey, yes, oh, let's help. It knows that it can help, so it will make a, an impulse to try to move past this barrier, to go in that direction. But sometimes also there is a, uh, no, that's later. <clears throat> so first, if this fear barrier gets set up and we react to it, then, <clears throat> and, and we abide by it and we do not cross it, then whatever care that we felt inside that wanted to penetrate that barrier <clears throat> is uh, it's impeded. It's, it's not allowed. And so we, we obey the fear rather than that care. Would I call it care? Yes. Yes. When there is, sometimes when we do feel care and we ignore it. So we do this one time and then we choose to obey our fear instead of our care and we're okay, then we then, then our fear gets a little stronger. 
and then we do it again, and then her hair perhaps uh, tries again, but then again it is repelled, and then okay, her theory continues, continues to be obeyed. And then if we do this continually and over and over and over and continually uh, obey our fear and do not allow this care to express itself, then eventually we begin to learn our, our system, the entire system learns that what we want to obey is this fear and not the care that we have inside. This happens via persistent habit. Via ha the habit of doing something continually, we develop the mm, we develop the assumption that this is the correct uh, signal to obey, and this one should be ignored. And if we do this over and over and over and over and over and over and over in life, we disconnect from the care that we have in ourselves. We can disconnect from that spark, that intuitively knows that we can and sometimes <clears throat> are and sometimes it would be beneficial to <clears throat> move through that barrier into the other world but it's later not listened anymore and then that's a problem if we lose our connection to that inner part of ourselves. Because I believe that that inner part of ourselves is the part that guides our growth. It focuses, of course, on, on care for other people. It is part of it. But it also is what drives us onto everything in life. It is that spark that makes us look for experiences that enrich us. It is that spark that makes us desire things that we have not seen or have experienced yet, but are beset by wonder by things. That spark that want, makes us want to mm, grow, to feel better, to learn, to, 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 to grow, to live more richly that spark i believe there is a spark there that <clears throat> guides us it can guide us if we allow it but we need to pay attention to it and by that i don't mean remove the barrier and let any internal impulse do whatever it wants to do. Because these barriers that have been set up, they have had a role. They have had a correct role in our in our development, both as humanity and as each of us as individuals. We are it is useful to learn that there is a circle of close responsibility and there are circles of wider responsibility as well and that it is important to choose whether to move past uh, each of these circles to extend our care to them But it's important also to remember that we have this spark. Because if we forget it, and it's very, very easy to become lost in life.
because then if we do happen to end up with wealth, with enough wealth to provide for ourselves and for our loved ones, then one can end up in a situation where one feels, oh, okay, I seem to have everything that I need. What, did I say this already? I'll say it again. <clears throat> yes, when one feels, oh, well, I have a situation where I have everything I need. And I want, I, there are some things I want, but they're not really like, they're not really like things I want. They're just like, yeah, yeah, I could have them, they're good. They're kind of like similar to the things that I've already got, that I've already wanted and already attained. So, I have all the things, so now, why am I not happy? And I posit that, can hap that happens because we lose our connection to our spark. Because that spark is that which leads us on to the path that can enrich our lives. And enrichment in our lives, I don't mean, I don't mean any wealth enrichment, I mean enrichment through learning and growth naturally brings happiness. It brings a sense of, of fulfillment. So a common strategy that develops when we believe that money equates to well-being or it leads to it is the strategy of optimization. It is a strategy based on rationality on material rationality <clears throat> that states a strategy to maximize one's chances of well-being are to maximize wealth which is often derived into maximize inflow and minimize outflow bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, and just spend little, as much, as little as you can in order to maintain our circle of personal well-being. Um, And I did not study economics, so I do not know how it is actually taught. But I do know that emotionally, that strategy is often used in a manner of, um, in a manner that encourages hoarding. It encourages us to keep as much as we can, to release as little as we can, to acquire as much as we can. And in a way, in a way we begin to rely on it and to believe that that strategy alone, or that strategy at least as a core part, that, that, that strategy is a core part of our toolkit to 
to achieve financial success. And I do believe it has <clears throat> value. Optimization. <clears throat> But I believe that it is often interpreted uh, incompletely because it often focuses entirely on what can be measured materially and shown numerically. when an economical problem is reduced to the standard of money. Then all the less material aspects of reality, like well-being and emotions and interconnectedness and um, richness of life, and development, human development as a whole, are not considered, but rather only the numbers and the money is considered, the material wealth possessions. And that model does not encompass the reality of humanity. It only encompasses a fraction of it. I'm not saying that it is easy to add in these extra qualities and aspects to, <clears throat> to problems of optimization to say, oh, just measure well-being, measure education, measure this, measure that. Mm. I'm not saying that they can be added in an extra, as extra variables in the formulae and, we will, and then we will have correct optimization results. What I'm saying is that each of us as individuals can learn to realize that can learn to realize when we are relying on these on this strategy of optimization. And when we realize that we are doing it, consider whether we actually want to. Do I want to rely my choices and my decisions on on this strategy? Do I believe that that strategy is enough to represent what I actually want in life? And for many people I believe that might be enough. It might be for at their, at their state in life. If, that, if the answer is yes, then let it be a yes. But I believe that for many people, something else might come up that will bring them to consider that there are other aspects to life, that their current optimization technique does not consider. The issue that I see with, the, with relying on this optimization strategy 
is that I see it as a sort of weakness, the need to rely on it. And by saying this, I don't mean to attack or criticize anyone who does. But I mean to emphasize that if we are relying on this strategy to lead our lives, then we are not developing our own capacity to lead our lives. And we are instead relying on a crutch of sorts to be able to, to live in this world, to have a certain to allow ourselves to stand up. We rely on this crutch to, to keep ourselves from falling. Oh, just have more money, just have more money, that's enough, just have more money, just have more money. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's all, that's enough. And it can work up to a point. It can keep us from poverty, it can keep us from lack, it can keep us from, from death. <laughs> But, but this reliance, as with any reliance on any external factors, does not allow our own capacities to grow and to develop. Because each of us humans, I believe, has the capacity to develop the strength and the balance and the correct the, the necessary sensitivity and intelligence that allows us to rely on ourselves to lead our lives and not on any external factors, not on any strategies or on any other, uh, the other people's authority but rather on our own perceptions and choices. It's as if <clears throat> if we have this, if we are using this strategy of of relying, uh, if, our, if our relying on this strategy of optimization, we're not allowing ourselves or to develop to the point that we can stand by ourselves and that we can gradually learn how to build up the strength in the parts of our body to bring us up, to develop the balance between the different parts of our body to keep us up, to develop the muscles that begin to activate, that prevent us from falling from one side or to another or to the front. <clears throat> learning to rely on oneself takes effort just like learning to stand by oneself takes effort but in both cases once one learns to do so one becomes that much freer.
another effect of this uh, strategy of optimization, <clears throat> especially when it's taken to its material extremes through numerical methods, is that it can bring people to squeeze out as much value, as much wealth as possible out from their surroundings and to hoard wealth into themselves. As with the analogy of the engine, it accumulates lubricant in certain parts of it, but then it dries up the rest of it. Hmm. The image that comes up is that of uh, somewhat of a, a banana. <clears throat> Where if we are asked to give a banana monthly to our, to our employees, assuming that we have that we have employees, then perhaps we begin by giving a banana to each of our employees. <clears throat> but then we realize through these methods of optimization and, and of optimization that we don't need to give the whole banana. Perhaps we can just dehydrate the banana and give it to them because that is technically enough. And then we can go over and just dehydrate them and give, and give our employees that. But then they end up with not enough. And that's something that can happen if we rely on our numerical methods to tell us what is correct instead of allowing our own criteria and our own choice to lead the way. <sighs> I wrote a few things down so that I would remember to speak about them. Hmm. Ah. There it is. Ah, yes. I think the last topic I want to <clears throat> mention about money is that of openness. Because as I see it in the world, money is not openly talked about. Not at a not at the, at the deep emotional level. It seems to be the, the, the core topic of money, it seems to be layered, uh, covered with layers of assumptions that each person believes that the, say, the other people will have the same assumptions as them. But they often dare not to touch them. They often dare not dig deeper into the assumptions that the other people have or that they themselves have very often because money is tends to be a very very prickly subject and by that i mean that <clears throat> it tends to flare up um, emotions very quite acutely that fear of lack can be flared up very 
acutely if if we feel threatened, if we feel that <clears throat> that there is a risk of danger to our lack, or oh, that perhaps a person wants money that I am unwilling to give, or perhaps money, or perhaps a person will will evaluate or criticize or know my worth because they know how much money I have. Oh, I have more than they than they thought they did. Oh, then I, I, I yes, I think I, I I'm ashamed because I I have more money. Or oh I have less money. Oh then I, I I'm ashamed because I have less money. <clears throat> so it tends to be a prickly subject. And we tend to not dig into our own assumptions. And we are not, and if we are not alone, and well, while all of these, while this topic of money is covered in all these layers of assumptions and of prickliness and of defenses that we have made unconscious defenses that we have made around the topic of money. Then we are not willing really to share our financial facts with people. Because they are tied so closely to these emotions of fear and shame. And I think that's important to notice. If we hide how much money we have, how much money we can give, how much money we are not willing to give, how much money we earn, how much money we spend, what we spend it on, <clears throat> to whom we give money to, who whom we do not give money to, I feel it's important to consider, to ask ourselves why. Not necessarily to just say things, to just expose everything that we, all of our, all of our data with anyone who asks it, asks for it, because I see the value of privacy. in this society which at the moment is beset by lack, by violence at the times. And by transgressions of each other. It makes sense to protect oneself and to not become a target of unwanted attention. However, knowing why we choose to hide some things or knowing why we choose perhaps to show some things some people show, some people actually mm -hmm. um, enjoy displaying their own wealth I feel it's valuable to consider to ask ourselves why and to seek to answer this for ourselves.
because while we do not do it, all of these assumptions, fears, and unconscious reactions will continue to live in us. will continue to guide our lives even when we do not want them to. And they can even prevent us from connecting to the true self that we are and from allowing us to grow as we are naturally led to. It's very important to connect with our spark. As initially uncertain as it may seem. Because any reliance on external factors, aspects, be that the opinion of other people, or money, or, or the strategies that we use to guide our lives, or the authorities of other people, or even or the material situation and context that we find ourselves in. Relying on many of these ultimately prevents our own growth, our own true growth. Each of these reliance on different external factors has a certain role in our developments whenever we are led to them <clears throat> led naturally to them I believe by our spark but once we have experienced them and we have acquired the value that they had for us either these opinions or these strategies, or the physical resources and skills and knowledge, we do not need to continue relying on them. Because we can develop the trust in ourselves to guide our own lives. <laughs> that is all.